Good evening. And welcome. Thanks for your presence. Second meeting. The theme that inspired us, from veiled faces, to the unveiling of the face. We are all still veiled, with these masks. Who knows how long it will last? More than masks, they look like muzzles. However, we deeply believed in the fulfillment of a prophecy. The prophecy, is a passage from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 25. Where the prophet says thus. He will destroy, on this mountain, the veil that veiled the face of all peoples, and the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people, he will remove from the whole hearth. For the Lord has spoken. May this really be a wish, a project, not just a desire. Since, as the word says, he does not send it, without it having achieved the end, which the Lord sent it for. And we are very, very happy about this. Today's theme is an extraordinary, fascinating subject. Perhaps, one of the really strong topics of the Shroud theme. Which is, in fact, photography, the image, the face, from the photographic discovery of the first photograph, to the many subsequent revelations. Precisely, the progressive unveiling of the face. Here, we practically let ourselves be accompanied by the face. The face on the screen, the face in the panels. And so, this evening, we go right inside, in the heart of the image of the face of Christ, towards the photographic discovery, with the writer and photographer, Daniela Di Sara, whom I thank for her presence here. And above all, let me thank the Reverend and dear Monsignor Domenico Repiccia. He is not yet Monsignor. In fact, he is Monsignorino. No, he is a friend. It's just a joke of course. And he dedicates himself, very much, to the Shroud, and, above all, he has developed the subject of the theology of the face of Christ. Each meeting is introduced with the reading of an actor, who went for a ride today because the weather is good. And, a short film. Today, we have selected, just as a tribute to Secondo Pia, but also to Daniela Di Sara, who is a photographer. An extraordinary photographer, famous in the history of the Shroud Studies. A Jewish photographer, named Barry Schwartz. He photographed the Shroud in 1978, when, with the Sturp Group, he took very, very important, interesting scientific pictures. But it will be directly he, who will introduce himself. And will also introduce this evening. Namely, from Pia's photograph, to the unveiling of Bernini's face. The Shroud of Turin provides a great challenge for science. It's a challenge because it's a piece of cloth that contains an image with physical properties unlike any other image I have ever seen, or anyone has ever seen. I have spent 32 years studying it. 32 years, half my life, studying it. And yet, I still don't have the answers. Barry Schwartz is American and a scientific photographer. He is escorting a group of pilgrims from the United States for a few days in Turin. His story with the Shroud began in 1976, just as he had finished working on a research project in Los Alamos National Laboratory, one of the best-known laboratories in the United States. The man I worked with from Los Alamos called me again and he said, Barry, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I laughed. I said, but I'm Jewish. <laughs> and he said, me too. He was also Jewish. And he said, and explained to me that at that point, a, uh, a number of scientists had taken a photo of the Shroud and he said they were so amazed that this image has such properties, they were going to put together a team of scientists 
to see if they could get permission to go to Turin and examine the shroud to try and determine how this image was formed. About two months into the project, I remember saying to one of the other team members, what is a Jewish boy like me doing on this? And he laughed and he said, you forgot that the man on the shroud is Jewish? And I said, no, I know this, I know. And then he gave me the best advice, maybe, of my whole life. He said, Barry, go to Turin. Do the best job you can do. God doesn't tell us in advance what the plan is, but one day you'll know. And this was great advice. And that kept me on the team. I was going to quit. But because of his words, from God maybe, through his lips, I stayed on the team, accepting the shroud of as authentic for years, 18 years. The blood on the shroud is still red. Old blood should be black or brown. And no one could answer for 18 years, why is the blood on the shroud still red? And then in 1995, in a telephone conversation with Dr. Alan Adler, Jewish blood chemist, who proved, by the way, the blood on the shroud was blood, proved it. He and I were on the telephone just having a conversation. And then he told me something I'd never known before. When someone is tortured over an extended period of time, 24 hours, 36 hours, right around the time of Jesus' torture, the body goes into shock. Jesus was given no water, he was beaten, he was scourged. Consequently, he went into anaphylactic shock. After a period of time in this type of shock, the cell walls of the red blood cells begin to break down. And the liver floods the body, the bloodstream, with an enzyme called bilirubin. And when that happens, the blood stays red forever. And when I found that out, that was the last piece of the puzzle. And that pushed me over the threshold and allowed me to accept the shroud as authentic because it gave me a scientific, credible answer to the last question I had. My life is better by a thousand percent than before because the shroud is in my life. So as a Jew, Maybe the greatest irony from my life. I'm a Jew who can say that my faith in God was restored by my study of the Shroud of Turin. So the Shroud isn't just for Christians. It's for everyone. We see a man that's just dead. We see a man whose face is swollen because his face was beaten. And you can actually see one cheek is more swollen than the other, but both are. There are scourge marks from a Roman flagrum, which was a whip with three leather thongs, and at the end of each was a lead weight that shaped like a dumbbell uh, that weightlifters use. And his body is covered with these scourge marks over 120. More amazingly, those crucifixion wounds in the hands, the blood stains on the shroud show crucifixion through the wrist because the Romans knew if they crucified in the palm, you could tear it loose. But if they nail you here, and the nail comes here, you can never pull this loose. We also see blood stains covering his head, as if from a cap or crown of thorns but not the beautiful things that the artists show us. Oh, 
The Roman soldiers were not going to take the time to weave a beautiful crown. They took a bush of thorns and smashed it onto his head, causing bleeding all over his head. And we see a wound on his side. The darkest blood stain on the entire shroud is from this wound. And the blood actually went around to his back. So we have this bloody cloth with all these wounds, and it is a perfect match to what it tells in the Gospels was done to Jesus. And so now, what are we left with? We're left with a radiocarbon date based on an anomalous sample that did not represent the main body of the shroud's cloth. And because of that, the radiocarbon dating of 1988 needs to be set aside and perhaps a new dating done at some point in the future. But I have to say one more thing. There is something called faith. And there comes a point with the shroud where science stops. In the end, each person must look at the shroud and decide for himself in his own heart what it means to himself. The shroud did not come with instructions, with a book that tells us what to believe. And I don't know that the answer is on the shroud, but in the eye and the heart of those that look upon it. There could not have been a better introduction, in fact, which is combined with the prophecy of Isaiah, but, above all, with today's theme, which is, precisely, photography. Thanks to Daniela Di Sara. With her, we have already had a wonderful experience, in Todi, with the face on the city, projecting the beautiful image, which is the result of research, and truly of discoveries, of, we can also speak of amazement. It is something that will accompany us, throughout the evening. Thanks Daniela, the word is yours. Then thanks to Alberto Di Giglio. Thanks to Father Massimo Nevola, who hosts us in this beautiful place, full of history and memories, even of the Shroud. And thanks to all of you, who are here, and with whom we will have this chat about photography. Not only on photography, and on the unveiling of the holy face of the shroud. Let's see for a moment. Today is a very special day, because it is May 28th. The first photograph of the shroud was taken exactly on May 28, 1898, and it was a moment. Here, there is a phrase that is used, abused, it is also unpleasant to me by dint of saying it, and hearing it say, Nothing will be the same as before. Here, for the shroud nothing has been the same as before, after May 28th. Seriously. Let's see for a moment what happened. Here we are a bit at the beginning of photography, because in May 1898, the photograph was officially homologated in 1839, and it had been a tiring start. But William Henry Fox Talbot said, at the dawn of photography, a very right thing, that, in photography, nature itself was drawing, with the light, its image. It was nature drawing itself with light. So, these are the two cameras with which Pia, who was the photographer who took the first photographs of the shroud, used to work. That on the right is the one which took the first photographs of the shroud. We are talking of the largest camera, the one you can see on the right. The one on the left was the camera he used to take photographs outdoor. Because Pia had photographed almost all the artistic heritage of Piedmont, and also part of that of Liguria. Let's see for a moment, how photographs were taken then. Let me spend two words to explain it quickly, because everything is changed in photography. So, this is a digital camera. The light, which draws nature, 
always, even with digital cameras, enters through the lens and imprints the images on a sensor. How does it impress them? Electronically. So much so, that, today, we are used, both those who use the mobile phones to take pictures, and those who use reflex cameras, we are used to immediately seeing the image that has been taken. This, instead, was an analog camera. It is an analog camera, which works very well, by the way. Inside there is a roll of film, which is a sensitive film. As light always works the same way, it enters through the lens, but if it doesn't have a photosensitive material to hold it back, we're talking about nothing. And, in Pia's time, what was this photosensitive material? The silver bromide, which was applied in film, just a gelatin, that was applied on a glass plate, which, precisely, was placed in one of these cameras, and produced a negative. A thing which we are no longer used to, with digital cameras. Because, here, the photograph is produced electronically, and it comes directly to the positive. In these machines a negative image was produced, which was then developed, fixed and printed. Before 1898, before that May 28, the situation was very simple. Because, in practice, there was the shroud, on which the image was visible less and less, because the more the cloth oxidizes, imagine if you put out a newspaper in the sun, the cellulose of the newspaper darkens and becomes yellowish, brownish in short. And the same thing happened to the cellulose of the linen fibers of the shroud. So as it darkens, indeed, in a while, the figure will perhaps be truly invisible, even if it has almost reached its maximum darkening. We see, in the images above on the right, that, in the ancient reproductions, it was much more visible. So this evanescence, which gradually occurs, we might say that has been stopped by photography, which continues to give us the image of the shroud. And this is one of the things that have never been the same. Then, the situation was simple. That is, the shroud was loved. There was an immense devotion to the shroud. Great personalities had gone to visit her. St. Francis de Sales, Queen Christina of Sweden had all gone to visit the shroud, and they had even wept over it. Which then, perhaps, will have created some problems in the dating with carbon-14, which in any case was scientifically inaccurate. 1898 was a very special year for Turin, because it was the 50th anniversary of the Albertine Statute, for which a general exposition had been made, an Italian general exposition. The picture above shows the entrance to the exhibition, and it is a photograph by Secondopia. Then there was the exhibition of sacred art and Catholic missions, the third centenary of the Confraternity of the Holy Shroud, deserving, because it has preserved everything that is known about the Shroud, all the documents. And then there was the exposition of the Holy Shroud, which, generally, took place for royal weddings. The wedding had taken place two years earlier, but the exposition had been moved, in order to allow a greater number of people to see the Shroud. There were about 600,000 visitors, which, considering the possibility of traveling at the time, was a large number. This is Secondo Pia. Secondo Pia was a very good photographer. There was always confusion on this regard. That is, he was a modest person, certainly modest. Not with regard to his economic capacity. He was a person, modest in his personality, and very correct. Which was why he was chosen for this particular job. He was an expert in art photography. Precisely, that, there, is the Madonna della Consolata, and, next to it, the photo of Pia. So, he was used to working inside, as he was used to working outside. But why was he considered an amateur photographer? It was his fault, because, out of modesty, he defined himself so. 
Since he belonged to an important family of lawyers from Asti, and he was as good as a lawyer, as he was as a photographer. And his father supported him in this activity, because he saw how much Pia, how much Pia Jr., how much Secondo Pia was good at it. And such support was necessary, because photography was very expensive then. Let's see. When he didn't work in a laboratory, and in any case he had to have a laboratory, he used to shoot with an outdoor camera. There it is. And he went around with a wagon, and an assistant. And he photographed all of Piedmont this way. And this, of course, was a very expensive business. Father Natale Nogir de Malage, Salesian, professor of chemistry and physics, proposed to the king, in this very special circumstance, to have photographs taken of the shroud. There had been two previous attempts. The first one had failed. In the second, a gust of wind, during the exposition, had raised the shroud and a great dust cloud. The photographer, who was trying to shoot, had also dropped his camera. He, unfortunately, said a blasphemy. And the people around, to say how much devotion to the shroud there was, beat him, even destroying the camera. So there were no previous photographs of the shroud. And this made Pia a true pioneer, because he did not know what he was about to face, when he started photographing the shroud. Above all, he wasn't prepared for the amazing thing that happened. So, that was the platform. The shroud, as you can see, was placed above the altar, in the cathedral. So he, first of all, oh, and let's say one thing, that he did all this work totally for free, out of enthusiasm, really for voluntary work. He set up a plato form. Imagine a kind of scaffolding. In order to be able to face the shroud frontally, and he was moved, on the ground, by two people. Calculate that, on top of the scaffolding, there was a condo pia, with this camera that you see, which is the one we have also seen before. That is a camera. I saw that one, I photographed it in Turin, at the Museum of the Shroud, which made a beautiful photographic exhibition, and also a remarkable photographic conference. Here, a camera perhaps taller than this. And then, imagine, on this scaffold, one and a half cubic meters of material, plus Pia, and, underneath, two people who moved it. There. That inverted image, is the image of a person standing in front of the camera. The light enters, the image is reversed, and gives an idea of the size of the plate. Pia, that evening, was able to take only two photographs, because, it wasn't the 28th, it was the 25th. And, on the 25th, he asked to have an evening available to rehearse, because he didn't know what he was getting into. The railways had provided him with two electric lights, except that one was 900 watts, the other 1000, with the result that the exposure was different. So there was a risk of having half an underexposed photograph, and half an overexposed one, as you can see in the second picture, in the negative, the one below. However, to avoid this problem, he put two sheets of frosted glass in front of the lights. The sheets, with the heat of the two headlights, burst. The project, for that evening, ended there. The next time, which was the 28th, today, the evening of the 28th, he found two huge problems. That of Pia was an adventure, an adventure with a happy ending, but it was an adventure. He found two enormous problems, Princess Clotilda had a glass placed in front of the shroud, and, at the same time, someone had removed all the bolts of the scaffolding. So, panic. That is, glass is one of the tragedies of a photographer. Whoever takes pictures knows it. Photographing something behind a glass, just look at the copy of the shroud over there. Think. Once I was walking in the mountains, and I hadn't brought any special equipment with me. I saw a beautiful fresco behind a glass, because it was outside, I tried to photograph it, and I took a beautiful photograph of the mountain range behind me. Yes, because, unfortunately, the glass reflects, and that's what happens. So what did he do? He had to move the famous refitted scaffolding, 8 meters back. 
And we see that, in fact, not only the shroud is depicted in the photograph, but also the whole altar, which is regularly negative. This is a negative. But it is a very particular negative, because, look, the shroud is not negative. Pia solved all the difficulties. Sorry, if I don't drink, I won't stop anymore. And he managed to produce two small test plates and four large, 50 by 60 centimeters, plates. Of which, the last one, being highly underexposed, was broken, I believe by Pia himself. Then he ran, because such plates needed to be developed immediately. As soon as they were taken, they had to be developed. So he ran into his laboratory, there it is, under which, the confraternity of the Holy Shroud had a plaque put, because the event was extraordinary, and it had to be celebrated. And let's hear how Pia himself described the situation. Closed in the dark room, I felt a very strong emotion, when, during development, I first saw the holy face appear, on the plate. Because the plate, the negative, had come a positive, a positive full of details, a positive that described everything. And there are two other testimonies. Don Tonelli, who was there, says, Pia told a friend of mine that, having placed the plate in the bathroom, he felt the need to jump, such was his emotion and happiness. Likewise, the nephew of the assistant, of the famous assistant, the Carlino, says, on the threshold of the dark room, it was Pia, still with a dripping plate in his hand, and his grandfather, coming to meet him, was struck by a strange expression of Pia. He looked down at the plate, and saw, standing, facing each other, the two could not take their eyes off that wonderful negative image, which, for their photographic experience, should have been a negative. Instead, instead, it was a spectacular positive. Pia was the first to break the silence. Look, Carlino, if this is not a miracle. Of course, the history of the shroud has not changed only in this sense. It has also changed because, before, the situation was calm and serene, and after, contradictories and insinuations immediately began. P will have changed the photographs, he will have them. That then, with that type of cameras, he could only have repainted the plates. So I don't understand. But what happened? That other people, who were present during the exposition, had taken other photographs with portable cameras. There were various types, that's one. And therefore, the other shots, not as beautiful, not as clear as Pia's one, but had shown that the negative came out that way. At this point, Pia extracted this face out of the large plate. And when he printed it, people queued out for days, to see the face of Christ. Because, the face of God has always evoked an immense desire to know Him. Since the time, for example, of the Bible, when it says, Your face I seek, do not hide your face from me, or show us your face, and we will be saved. This was the first face. The first face that was revealed. A long time passed. Ah, uh, when this news was published on the Observatory Romano, it went around the world, and it was actually thrilling. Then, after 33 years, Giuseppe Enria, a great photographer from Turin, was called to take other shots of the shroud. That, this time, not only turned out very well, but they remain the photographs on which the shroud has been studied for years and years, both photographically, and from a scientific point of view. What had happened? There had been the wedding of Umberto of Savoy with Maria Gios of Belgium. And Cardinal Fassati, in 1931, commissioned Enria to take these other photographs. Now, Enria certainly had an advantage over Pia in the first place, because he knew what he was going to see, what he was going to photograph, and he had Pia's experience behind him. But he also had the help of Pia, who you see aged there, but who helped him anyway, 
assisted him in the development of these plates. So, he managed to take three complete images of the whole shroud, of various dimensions. Then, he managed to take five photos of details, on large plates 40 by 50 centimeters. Think that the face, on a plate 40 by 50, is reproduced with a 1 to 1 ratio, and therefore it is perfect. One square centimeter of the photograph is equal to one square centimeter of the face. And then, he took three photos of the shroud, divided into three equal parts, and one of the shroud in its frame, 18 by 24 centimeters large, which surely was used to make all the subsequent souvenirs, and such sort of things. So now, very briefly, I will try to explain the situation to you. The photographs were black and white at the time. They were black and white, but the light, the visible spectrum of light, has various wavelengths. So there is the spectrum of blue, the spectrum of blue and green, the spectrum of medium yellow, orange, and red. Then, before and after, there are ultraviolet and infrared, which are not visible. Back then, at the time, we are 33 years later, the plates were orthochromatic, isochromatic, or panchromatic. That is, the orthochromatic plates only picked up blue and green, they were sensitive only to blue and green. The isochromatic ones also to yellow and orange, the panchromatic also to red. What changed, since they were black and white? that these plates gave a gray scale, and the wider the sensitivity to the spectrum was, the panchromatic ones took all the colors and gave a much wider gray scale, and, therefore, of course, produced photos. Imagine if it had to be taken the picture of, what can I say, a garden, an avenue, a person. The more varied range of shades of gray, they were able to produce, which gave more beautiful, softer photos. But Enria's clever choice was that, after all, he didn't have all these colors in front of him. The shroud had just two colors, right? And, instead, he was very interested. Since the image was very faint, it was very light. He was very interested in the contrast. So he chose the older plates, the orthochromatic ones, and told Capelli, who supplied them to him, to make them sensitive also to medium yellow, and a little to orange, but to make them sensitive to wavelengths below 560 nanometers. Why? In order to have more contrast. But that choice was a winner, because, since there was no red and the plates were not sensitive to red, he could do a development not in complete darkness, looking only at the clock, but on sight, watching the development as it proceeded, and being able to stop it, when it was satisfactory. This made Enria's plates fantastic. Watch. Earlier here, Barry Schwartz has bought me some time. These are all the blows of the whip, of the scourge, that were on the body of the man of the shroud. The wounds in the feet, in the hands, everything, really everything. And on this, a doctor named Utica Cordelia began to study. We shall specify that it was Utica Cordelia father. Because then, there was a Utica Cordelia son, photographer, and a third Utica Cordelia, nephew, who continues to work on photographs. These are the large plates of Enria. The wrist, the back, the flagellated back, two of his face. But look at the splendor of this face, with all these details, which Barry Schwartz described to you very well before. We have named Giovanni Battista Utica Cordelia. Here he is. In 1969, Cardinal Pellegrino considered the issue of controlling the conditions of the shroud. So he set up a commission, and, in 1969, a lot of water had passed under the bridges of photography. So Utica Cordelia could, and wanted to take the photographs in color, ultraviolet, and infrared. Those of Utica Cordelia are the first color photographs of the shroud. Here is the face of the shroud shot by Utica Cordelia. You see? That is a panchromatic plate. It was still the view camera. It was still the kind of old camera we saw. 
So it was panchromatic, you see? Photography is much softer, right? And below, the other face it's in ultraviolet. Um, yes. In ultraviolet. Well. But it was my intention, also to let you hear the impressions of those who were close to the shroud, what they felt. He says, as the eyes got used to it, and that was a really shocking moment. I noticed that the bottom of the canvas, under the shape, he was working in ultraviolet, took on a gray color, like the ash of a cigarette. While the shape became a positive, as if there had been a man in his dorsal and ventral side, lying on the sheet, as if raised by about 30 centimeters. The extraordinary thing was that this play of chiaroscuro really gave the impression of a body, but of a body in three dimensions. It was a shocking moment. We arrive at 1978, indeed 1977, in which two scientists of the Academy of the U.S. Air Force John Jackson and Eric J. Jumper, studying the shroud. They were interested, they were intrigued by it, had the impression that, in the shroud, there was a three-dimensional information. They became even more interested in the shroud. John Jackson was able, with true American skill, to put together, in a short time, a group of 40 scientists, of 40 high-level scientists, all willing to carry out this study for free. Here returns this gratuitousness of those who deal with the shroud, and to be allowed to stay with the shroud for five days, and six consecutive nights, to do all the scientific experiments of all types. What is more, a company that produced machineries for laboratories also offered the equipment. And John Jackson managed to raise public funding necessary to cover all expenses due to be able to send this equipment to Turin, and bring it back. Eight tons. Eight tons of material, that arrived in Turin. And all the equipment was blocked at the customs. They had six days to set up the lab, and, for five days, the material was stuck there. Cardinal Balestrero had to go on his own, to clear this material through customs. And the cloth arrived in the lab, just while they were finishing assembling the tilting table, they were going to work on. Barry Schwartz, whom we have seen before, says, for nature, he was the photographer, the unscientific photographer. He was the photographer who had to document all the work of the STIRP, Shroud of Turin Research Project. Barry Short said, I also became the unofficial archivist of the STIRP data, the majority of which is available to everyone on Shroud.com. It's a precious creation that Barry Schwartz has realized. Really. Here. Look at this for example. It was one of the experiments. Because they discovered that the image of the shroud was most likely created by a luminous radiation, which had burned, scorched, dehydrated the linen fibrils very superficially. Very, very superficially. We are talking about millionths of a millimeter. Here then. The shroud, illuminated from the front, gave the whole image. Backlit, you could see the blood, but you couldn't see the image. Jackson, years later, said that he still felt, after 37 years, the burden of trying to conduct scientific tests on the shroud, with the utmost responsibility. As per Schwartz, I'm not going to reread it, because he just said it. The scientists of the STIRP were of all religious faiths, even atheists, agnostics, of all kinds. But behold, he, Schwartz, he was from a Jewish family. He wasn't even very practicing we might say, came to this conclusion. But, once I came to the scientific conclusion that the cloth was authentic, I also came to understand its meaning. And he said one of the most beautiful phrases, that is, this is the forensic document of the passion.
It's gorgeous. And he says, because, because it documents, makes us see, makes visible everything that was done to Jesus, which is said in the Gospels. He says, I think there is enough evidence to prove that that is the cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus. The truth about Jesus, he says, is within the competence area of the faith. However, he was convinced that this was the sheet that had wrapped him. We arrive at 1997. John Carlo Duranta. What had happened in the meantime? Two facts, one before, and one after. The shroud was donated by the king to the Pope, and therefore to the Holy See. And then instead, in 1997, we are immediately after the fire which destroyed the Guarini Chapel, that has been reopened just now. And the shroud was saved, we can say, just miraculously, because it had been previously taken out of the chapel. Otherwise, with those two stairs, I don't think they would have been able to save it. A curious fact. When the Chambéry fire broke out, four firefighters went to save the shroud under the chapel that collapsed under fire. And, equally, four firefighters, in Turin, pulled out, managed to break through the armored case and to pull out the shroud. And, when reality surpasses fantasy, May the 4th, the Feast of the Shroud, is also the Feast of St. Florian, patron saint of firefighters. This was accidental, because such date was not chosen for this reason. Then, Duranta intervened with all the means that photography offered him at the time. He was an exceptional photographer. The photographs were gorgeous. So much so, that the 1997 face was requested by the news magazine Time, to make the cover, and to really throw. There was a frenzy at that point for the shroud, in the whole world. Then, he also took the photographs of 2000 and 2002, in which he also managed to scan the back of the cloth, seeing that in fact, there was no image on the back. During an interview in 2007, he says, I believe that only the eyes, opened by the faith, can see what it is, the image of the man of the Gospels, who bears the signs of my violence on his body. The austere but serene image of that face which, at the moment of his death on the cross, asks for forgiveness for me, because I do not know what I am doing. The image of the tortured body, which asks me to do something for all the bodies still martyrized today. The invitation to have the courage to stop and pray. You see, the people who spent time with the shroud, then had feelings of this kind. Oh, mind you, the shroud is not a dogma of faith. Therefore, everyone can reach the conviction he wants about the shroud, that he or she feels as his or her own about it. However, it is true that the shroud is a challenge, very true. But it is also a proposal, a proposal to delve into it, to stay a little close to it, to read it, to reflect on it. Then you can reject it, or not reject it, as you wish. Ha! Huh. I recommend the images of which, in the stirp, there was a scientific photographer, Vernon Miller. If look for him on the web, you will find a Vernon Miller, who is a serial killer. It's not him. Then there is Vernon Miller, who, instead, researched the word shroud, jointly with his name, and you will find all the images, of all kinds, very well organized, and arranged in galleries, which are very good for studying. Then, later, also Aldo Gariski intervened, with whom, I had the pleasure of speaking. A very pleasant person, and he too saw the shroud after the fire. Of course, they had all been called on a very short notice, because the shroud had been hidden after the fire. It was not known yet which had been the causes of the fire, the origin of the fire, but there was the intention to check, to provide documentary evidence of the conditions of the shroud. So all of them went, on a very short notice, Duranta was the fastest, he managed to be ready. Not even the prefect managed to arrive, but Duranta did. And Gariski said, he told me that he had had a strange impression, seeing there the shroud wrecked. He says, the impact was definitely surprising, because, when I saw that helpless and docile cloth, where almost no trace of the image could be seen, but only a whole set of various creases and wrinkles, with furthermore stains and burns, I thought I was before. I felt dismayed by the impression of finding myself in front of a rag. Did it go blank? What happens? Well, so I rest for a moment.
Did you touch any? Not me. Okay. Now it comes back. Shall I go on then? Okay, let's go on. And in the meantime, let me explain the matter. You see there, no. You see absolutely nothing. Then, Gariski, in his photographies, had already made an experiment on three-dimensionality. But the idea that Jackson and Jumper had had, which was then carried out in Turin by Thamborelli and Noello Balassino, found confirmation. Why? How? So, can we see the screen? No? Then I'll go on. Let's see. Although Guariski has perfectly talked about three-dimensionality, he explained it well. It's not easy. He says that, on the shroud, the pattern is visible also in those parts that did not come into direct contact with the skin, with different intensities, that vary in proportion to the distance between the cloth and the skin itself. Then, each of the pixels of this photograph contains in itself the information of such distance, and, putting these data inside a computer, with an algorithm, three-dimensional images came out. Here, Nilo Balassino managed to obtain a sort of a statue, a three-dimensional image of the entire front of the shroud. And, by the way, he did another experiment too. That is, if the same procedure is applied to a photograph, to a drawing, to a painting, you see the Mona Lisa there, there is the face of Leonardo, this three-dimensionality does not come out. The three-dimensionality is an exclusive feature of the shroud, and of no other two-dimensional image. Photography is almost at the end of its research. Only how 9000? It was the project of a company, with a particular computer. Made 1649 shots of one centimeter each. That is to say that they scanned the shroud centimeter by centimeter. They realized this whole series of shots, that are still partially to be analyzed. The output was a whole series of. It was in high definition, at 1200. Today 1200 dpi is no longer high definition. Now, these are all the shots of the face that, gradually, has been taken. The one after the what's then is that of HAL 9000. Where are we now? Where did we arrive? As a conclusion of all these things, we have. I am not talking about scientific studies, because Professor Marinelli has explained them very well. And Baldacchini as well gave a beautiful lecture last Friday. What do we have? A cloth, which certainly contained a corpse, which is also stained with blood which has an image printed on both sides by an orthogonal light radiation. It has not been taken from one side or the other. Centimeter to centimeter. Millimeter to millimeter. Upwards, downwards. Which has three-dimensional characteristics. And that, on the base of what we just said, could seem the first photograph in the world. That is to say, Light. We have said that light creates, draws the photographic image. And this was made by a light. What is missing? There is no photosensitive medium. The scorching of the various linen fibrils, created the image. And then, something else comes to mind, which, in this way, would probably occur to a poet. That Jesus often said, I am the light. He was the light, but the darkness comprehended it not. Of course, the real meaning was different for heaven's sake. But there is something to think about. Well, I can assure you, there is no proof, the conclusive evidence, the undeniable proof that the shroud is authentic. But, surely, there is proof that it is not a human artifact. At least, until now it was not possible, it is not possible, to recreate it. To produce it, as we were told, as Professor Baldacchini from Ania told us the other day, and as the studies that were made at Ania also by Paolo di Lazzaro testify, show us, to make the whole shroud, they obtained shroud-like samples, with an excimer laser. But reproducing a whole shroud would take a quantity of excimer lasers to cover the facade of a whole building, and millions and millions of kilowatts. So, for one reason, and for the other, it is not yet possible to make it. 
But we still have a doubt. Let's go back to your face I seek. This is the face of a serene man. In the sleep of death. Who has suffered the unbelievable and who bears all the traces of his sufferings. But then. How is it this face? The face of this man? How was he alive? How? How could we have seen him alive? With his expressions? With his attitudes? This is a question to which we have had an answer for the man of the shroud for sure. Once again, from photography. And, this time, I'm afraid that I was the culprit, albeit very casually. I was, with a photographic exhibition of mine on the theme Your Face Lord I Seek. It was a search for the face of God in the splendor of nature. And, as Professor Kutsi says, beauty is a way to the absolute. And I was staying in St. Sebastian outside the walls, in Rome. And I saw this wonderful bust of Bernini. It seemed to have a light of its own. It is a bust in Carrera marble, but of unique beauty. And I remained looking at it, while continuously asking myself a question. I had a persistent thought, where have I already seen it? This bust had gone lost for almost 300 years, and it had been found by Professor Petrucci, the director of the Museum of Baroque, and attributed by Maurizio Fagiolo dell'Arco. He had found it, right in St. Sebastian, and this had happened in 2001, so I hadn't seen it yet. It was a wonderful thing. I looked at it, I looked at it, and another thing struck me, besides the idea of probably knowing him, that it had a number of expressions that were not normal for a statue, for something that was made of marble. Because, depending on the point where I looked at it, it had so many different expressions. At this point, Father Stefano Tamburo, who is an art expert, arrived. In that period, he was exactly studying, he was delving into his art studies. I told him, Father Stefano excuse me, but this face, because, at a certain point, I had a kind of mental revelation, but it resembles the shroud, the face, the features of the shroud. I told him, Father Stefano, but, in your opinion, might Bernini have known the shroud? I still feel affection for him, because he didn't say to me, Madam, you are crazy, or Madam, are you a drinker? No, he said to me, Madam, you shall do a research. And thus, the research began. Of course at that point, I was very intrigued, wasn't I? So, when I got home, just rough and ready, the first thing I did was to print the face of Bernini's bust on paper and Imri's face on a transparent sheet. And I said, let's see how much they are similar. And there, I understood, in a very minor way, the terrifying shock that Pia had. Because they didn't just look alike, they overlapped perfectly. They also overlapped in the typical details of the shroud. Namely, the blow on the nose, the blow on the cheekbone, and the blow on the eye. Um, do you want me to? Is it still needed? And so, I was really amazed at this. Then I delved into my research, because, since that moment, I had done everything just extemporaneously. And then I said, no, here it is necessary to study the situation better, even with the help of my photography teacher and with other photographers. I started studying. Sorry, I started studying this face. And it turned out that it overlapped perfectly. Do you see? And this is not objectionable. It is really, really superimposable. So, that, is definitely the face, of the man of the shroud. And, it is the face of the man of the shroud, in various expressions. Why? Later we will understand why. At this point, the photographic research was over. But of course, any discovery need to be documented and proved to be true. Differently it becomes just a novel. Then, I began to do a historiographical research as well. Bernini was a close friend of the Queen of Sweden. Queen Christina of Sweden, who had been educated by Descartes, who died of pneumonia in Sweden, to educate the Queen. 
had abdicated the throne to come to Rome. No, at this point, I no longer have neither a mouse nor anything else. Okay, but I'll go on. The Queen of Sweden had abdicated the throne and had come to Rome. She was a very remarkable character because she had a boundless culture. She loved art and had a vast, not narrow spirit. They could talk she and Bernini. She was Bernini's counterpoint for all the problems of a great relevance. Architecture, culture, religion, everything. So, in the 1600s, the shroud was universally considered the greatest relic of Christianity. And Queen Christina had gone to Turin, in 1655, to visit the shroud. And she had cried over it, as we said. Well, Bernini was a very religious person and often frequented the Church of the Gesù, hereabout, where he used to talk with his friend Father Giovanni Paolo Oliva, as well as he used to talk with all the popes of his time. They talked about spiritual problems, so much so, that he was considered a profound expert in such issues. The great critic Lavin, discovered that Bernini was very devoted to a devotion that existed in Rome at that time. That is, the devotion to obtain a good death, a death that would free the one who prayed, who was repentant of his or her sins, because the blood of Christ, offered by Our Lady to God, as he drew in one of his drawings which he had later painted into a picture, the Sanguis Christi, redeemed the world from its sins. Then, in 1665, Pope Alexander VII, who had Bernini built the colonnade of St. Peter, and many other splendid masterpieces, which had changed the face of Rome, sent him quickly, so leaving a work he was finishing in the Kigi Palace in Aricia, that was to be inaugurated soon. Pope Alexander VII was a Kigi. He sent him to France, for a double reason. Louis XIV badly wanted him to urgently finish the Louvre project, and, on the other hand, there was a serious diplomatic problem at that moment, between the Holy See and France. And Bernini was precisely the third person, who could better carry out this mission. Arrived in Turin, in this journey, he was accompanied by the Duke of Crecy, cousin of the king, and by a French crew of high-ranking people. Arrived in Turin, he found an exposition of the shroud, because there was the wedding of the sovereign Carlo Emanuele II with a royal blood princess, the princess of Nemours, Maria Giovanna Battista of Nemours. As I wandered around, looking for the documentation of all this, I found ancient documents. These are the court ceremonials of the House of Savoy of that year, in which, it is said that a group of French people that were passing through Turin in those days were introduced to His Royal Highness by the French ambassador. So Bernini saw the exposition of the shroud, but he had such and so many merits in Turin and so many contacts with high-ranking people that certainly, even without this circumstance, he would not have had any difficulty to see it. Bernini was a very famous portraitist. Why? Because Bernini's portraits were called, even by that time, the marbles that breathe, the living marbles. Today Petrucci calls them the snapshot marbles. Because you see, Bernini carved the portrait of the most important people of his time. All the popes, a couple of kings, nobles. These portraits really did have something alive. They rendered the person alive, forever. As soon as he arrived in France of course, the king asked him for a portrait. That Bernini immediately carved, the people then queued for several days to see the king's portrait. However, in Paris, he continued to think about the shroud. This is demonstrated by various drawings and documents of his, which kept recurring on this theme. 
but above all, he thought, religious as he was, that he had seen his Lord in Turin. He considered Louis XIV a great monarch, a great king, a vast spirit. He had never seen a man of such good metal, he used to say. But the other one was his God, and he began to think about making the impossible portrait, the portrait of the King of Kings. There, he made friends with Pierre Quiro de la Chambre, a priest of the royal palace who was also an expert in physiognomy, who followed him to Rome for a year. He remained in Rome, and, later, he had a copy of the bust of the Savior made, which he placed in France, in the royal chapel, and then he kept it at his house too for a while. Then, so, his son Domenico, who is also one of his biographers, says that Bernini, in that work, summarized and restricted all his art. The other son, Filippo, says that his father completed the bust at the age of 81. Look at how many expressions. These are just a few, not to bore you. Balvinici, the other biographer, says, in it, he instilled all the efforts of his human devotion. Bernini himself said, the artist who is very well founded on design, when he reaches the decrepit age, must not fear any diminution of vivacity and tenderness, and of the other good qualities of his work. Here. Look at how many different expressions. It's a piece of marble. It is a stone. Here you can clearly see, in the vertical picture on the left, the blow to the nose, which is crooked, the puffiness of one cheekbone, partly also of the other. The eyebrows, look, one is higher than the other. So, what happened to this marble? We're almost done. He tried to give this marble to the queen. He had previously talked about it only with Queen Christina, and with Pierre de la Chambre. They only knew the secret of this marble. Bernini, when he was about to die, said, in his bed, said to Cardinal Azzolini, who also had acquaintance with the queen, he said to plead in his name, Her Majesty the Queen to do, for the love of God, one thing for him. Because, he believed that that great lady had a particular language with the Lord God, to be well understood. While God had used a language with her, which she alone was able to understand. And so he gave the bust to the queen. The queen refused it, because she said she had nothing so precious to give in return. Kuichi also says that, not infrequently, when it manifests itself, that of God is a splendor that frightens. Bernini had a recurring idea. That time was due to discover the truth. Then, he had had a mirror made for the queen, in which coincidentally, Kronos, the time, carried a shroud. He unveiled the truth, taking out a shroud. You see, it also goes down to the back of the mirror. Surely, he was not referring to the fact that the queen was getting old. At this point, he bequeathed the bust to her, and the mirror in Cursini Palace, at the time Riario Palace, where the queen used to live, was seen by Tissen, right in the rooms that were the queen's apartment, together with the bust of the savior, which probably was reflected in it. Well, we have reached the end of this photographic journey. The Savior reflects the beauty of God. And let's go back to Kachi. Beauty is a way to the Absolute. Saint Augustine says, Beautiful is the Word who is with God. But He is also beautiful in the Virgin's womb. He is beautiful in heaven, and beautiful even on earth. Beautiful in His miracles, beautiful under the scourges, beautiful on the cross, beautiful in the tomb. Let Him come to us, so that we may gaze on Him with the eyes. It is Saint Augustine, and we can also say, beautiful in the shroud. So, we have finished. And we thank you for your patience, for your attention. Thanks to photography and to Bernini, for having unveiled his face. Thanks to Father Massimo Nevala and to Dr. Alberto Di Giglio, for having allowed us to discover it here, in this beautiful Caravita Oratory. And thanks to all of you, for the company you have kept me.